situation it turned out to be. Joe wasn't hurt, but within minutes, Murraysville police chased down Clint Robinson of Maryland and got him in custody. Police believe this act is all part of a much larger crime ring and scheme known as the Jamaican lottery scam, and this local case is now being looked into by the state attorney general and FBI. If you're getting what you think is a scam, just hang up on them. It's the easiest thing to do, you know, and if it's something that's repeated or continues, you know, call us. Robinson is only being charged with aggravated assault by vehicle for hitting Joe because he wasn't communicating directly with him. But Robinson's bond was set at a half a million dollars. We're told Homeland Security and the Postal Service are also involved in this investigation. Reporting live in Westmoreland County tonight, I'm Melanie Marcelco for Channel 11 News. This is it, TV. I can talk. We're the I can talk. Icons, icons, good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are. Today is Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. And today marks a significant day in my life and in my history. It marks five years to the day, exactly to the day that I got arrested in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, and charged with two counts of vehicular assault and attempted vehicular assault. Now, thank you for tuning in. I promise you guys this special bonus edition. And I'm hoping to fulfill and follow through on that promise. This is the first time ever that I'm going to speak on this incident. And I'm calling this locked up abroad. You know, 15 days of uncertainty and fear. Now, I don't know if this microphone put on the right way. That's why I'm going to cover it up still. But let's, let's just work with it for now. Remember, I say I'm not officially a tech guy. Let me start off by saying the misconception and the allegations out there are completely false. It's been reported that, or it was reported that I was locked up on some Jamaican chopping, for want of a better phrase. If you know the know, you know the know, you know. We really don't want to use certain words on YouTube because the algorithm is really funny. But again, let me re-emphasize, I was only charged with a vehicular, attempted vehicular assault, all right? Um, another misconception, as you would have heard in the news report earlier, that I was chased down by the cops. I was never chased down by any cop. 
I pulled over voluntarily and consented to that accosting by the police officer. <clears throat> For reasons that you may, well, I, I well imagine you must understand. I won't get into the deeper intricacies of that case. Today I'm only going to speak on my experience being locked up and my experience going through that whole process. Hopefully it will provide someone else with an insight, you know, how to avoid these kind of things and, you know, why you don't want to get yourself mixed up, you know. You know what I mean? Jailhouse business is not pretty, whether yard or abroad, you know. Another thing I want to do, I want to show you guys how dealing with the law enforcement, with law enforcement and any matter can be tricky and a lot of people get tripped up if they don't know the law or know how to conduct themselves you know in an interview or anything similar so here we go Fif locked up abroad 15 days of uncertainty and fear and you know what let me call it trepidation not quite fear so as I said before the arresting officer actually drove past me with the sirens blaring and I guess based on his description of the car he recognized me immediately and I saw in my rearview mirror when he turned you know I was driving along normal pace 45 to 50 miles per hour on the on the street as soon as he turned around I knew I was, I was getting pulled so when he came up behind me, I pulled over. It was a narrow stretch of road. I pulled over. When I pulled over, like I say, it was a very professional encounter. He came up, um, asked me my name. He asked me what I was doing in this part of the woods. I told him um, I, I was here on um, some, some business. He, um, you know, but we knew what, what he was all about, you know what I mean? I wasn't stupid. Long and short, let me skip that. I know some shit get real when him tell me some me under arrest. I can remember him, him talking to someone on the radio. And the person on the radio said, he's on probation. And I said to him, I said to him, I'm not on probation. Like, what, what are you talking about? But I had had a traffic violation in Maryland, and I was on a traffic violation, a traffic traffic probation. So when they became, when that became clear, now you know that cleared up. Shit get real in my mind when those handcuffs go on. I can remember thinking to myself, "What the f is this? Like this is that is the moment." when I realized I was in deep hot water. Anyways, I'm going to the back of the, 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 um, the, the vehicle. I distinctly remember it was so tight. You know, I'm a tall guy, six foot five. It was so tight that I could not sit there, back there comfortably. But this little place, Greensburg, does not have a, a police, a precinct per se. It's just a little thing with, with, with hole in cells, you know? So, um, then bring me go up at the, the jail and then put me into this holding cell. I was the only person, there was two holding cells. Two, the only person in the holding cell. I remember exactly the, 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 the exact time that I got accosted. Because when it, as soon as I pulled me over, I looked on the clock from my radio and it said 10.34 a.m. Never forget. So by the time I came up at the station, it was like 11, 11.02. And I can remember saying, the first thing I said to him, said, I need to call, I need a call, I need to call home. And he's like, we'll get to that. Um, he made it known that there was an officer coming in to speak to me. No, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. By four or five o'clock now, I'm starving because I, I hadn't eaten anything that day. But I was just pacing around the cell thinking. I was thinking about my family, thinking about my kids, thinking about my mother, you know. And I'm like, actually, I was thinking about 
At my age I know, I should look for come from for a work course instead of go. That me remember saying that because that was a popular phrase my mother always used growing up as a joke. Even my grandmother like when they talk to certain people, I said, me master, me should they look for come from work house now instead of go. So I was, I was actually thinking about that. At about five o'clock, an officer came to the cell and said to me, are you hungry? And I, I knew it was a good cop, bad cop kind of thing. Because as soon as he said that, another officer appeared from out of nowhere. And he was like, he just stand up there. So the one who asked me if I'm hungry, I said, yeah, I'm starving. He said, um, what do you want to eat? I mean, I don't, I don't fucking know what I want to eat. What do you have? He said, um, well, the food here isn't that great. We have some sandwiches here, but it's not that great. There's a subway close by. And the man actually took my order. <laughs> As the man took my order, the other bad cop standing there and was like, no, no, we have bologna sandwiches in the back. And he turned to him and he said, cold sandwiches? He said, yeah. He said, no, we're not going to give this guy cold sandwiches. Come on. So he saw him, him he didn't mind him, I saw him. He left the subway, get him one and come back. So I had a nice subway meal, tuna, everything we need upon it. But I kept asking him when I can get a call. Wherever this officer was coming in from to speak to me, he was taking a long time. Um, so eventually about, no, but in, that, in between that time, I had a virtual meeting with a judge, right? And um, the judge, this was my, um, well, my, yeah, my first hearing. The judge offered me, well, you know, I pled not guilty on the virtual hearing. And, you know, I kept saying, you know, I still not get a phone call, I not get a first phone call. And the judge going like him, never even hear me, you know, and try to hear that. The judge, um, the judge set, set a bail hearing, a bail bond for me at 50,000. And thing, and I'm like, okay, good. Um, so I went back to the cell. And when I went back to the cell, you know what? Scratch that. I apologize. The officer came in and interviewed me for about an hour. And he was with the Pennsylvania State Police, no, the Attorney General's Office and Homeland Security. It was a giant task force on the chopping business, what them think, you know, me involved in. So the officer came in and um, we did our interview. I might try to get something out of me which wasn't there. And I'll tell you this, this is the first lesson. I want to tell people who will find themselves in a similar situation. Whether it be for this or anything else, wrongly accused or rightfully so. The most important thing you can do is keep your mouth shut until you're represented. You have a right to remain silent. So I was kind of adhering to that at first. But then I realized something. I realized that I had to say something. I had to say something, probably not what he wants, but I had to set my own narrative because I knew I wasn't going to get a lawyer fast anytime soon. And I also knew because they didn't even give me a phone call. I also recognized where I was, right? So I knew I had to keep my mouth shut. But then I felt the need to say something, to present my, at least a portion of my story out there without, you know, implicating anyone in anything because there was nothing to implicate anyone in anyway. But you know, if you allow law enforcement to set their own narratives, that is what will be presented in front of a judge and that is what will carry you through and you have to be forced to defend that. So always remember, the burden, the, the burden of guilt or the, the burden of proof is always on the prosecutor. They have to always prove their case. You don't have no burden to prove your innocence because you're presumed innocent until found guilty. I always remember that. So 
if you allow them to set a narrative early because everything that you say in that early um, interview is going to be used against you in a court of law everything you say or not say all right so i had to set my own narrative in that interview which wasn't exactly what they wanted to hear but at least that story that narrative was told so fast forward now again judge see the judge virtually and um band set gone back on me um holding cell half an, half an hour later they come back to so the judge wanted to speak to me again so i went back into the virtual room the judge said mr robinson you i heard you're planning you're planning to go to jamaica in two days i was i was scheduled to go to jamaica on the thursday and i said yeah he said mm. pretty much he said you're a flight risk no and you're from maryland yes so you're a flight risk so he upped the bond to five hundred thousand dollars half a million shit no realize i'm stuck um this is another section of my reach i'm going to advise again some of you who may or may not find yourself in similar situations mind you may talk calm now but i was scared shitless throughout all of this i was super scared you know but what you find and if you don't know this it, it will end up hurt you what you will find is that a lot of people when they get jammed up the first you're thinking about getting out so much going back to your family all of a sudden all the picking away in their mind become the most important person in your life you will want to see that you will want to see him the girlfriend who you've been treating like shit the wife who you've been treating like shit becomes the number one priority oh my god you can't wait to see them and you go hug them up and kiss them you think about all these kind of things you will never ever again you probably baptize as you walk out so law enforcement knows these things they know these things they study these things in psychology and they know your desire to get out creates a weakness so they will play on that so that's why the good cop bad cop thing come and in the interview they'll pretend to understand everything what you say and they will pretend to be there to help but they're really just there to get a confession out of you to something where either you do whether you do it or not you'll go to prison for so in these moments these time frames that they stretch out right they're giving you the time to think they're giving you the time to let it soak in but just enough so they can pounce at a time at a moment of vulnerability so this is why you see a lot of a lot of us like admit to something just forget it all because you are led to believe just tell me now and you're going home to your family they will actually say that to you so it's important for you stand your ground especially if you need the nun you know so we went through that process where we stand my ground um eventually now probably about nine o'clock them load me up in a van because i thought this was where it was it was a pretty nice jail and i'm here alone and i say yeah well it's all right next thing me know but then load me up in a van because apparently it's just a hole in cell and that jail go close at some point for the evening close the business <laughs> you know so they bring me down a westmoreland county prison which is this which was a as it suggests a county prison with people that do hard time well let's not say hard time but people get sentenced up to two years in this prison so people are doing time there you know, because it was the only facility that could house prisoners whether you're on pre-trial or you're already to serve sentence and i remember i pulled up to the prison westmoreland county prison about 9 30 that evening still not get a call and this was the second moment i realized uh, shit is real pull into the prison and go through the whole security situation and thing got inside a bunch of big burly officers greet me like it's a wrestling match and i remember them i said oh you big guy you know and 
that them saying that just make three more big officers came and the first moment of my dehumanization was when I went into the process me paperwork wise and shit and then they brought me into a room with a whole bunch of crocus bag looking outfit in there and I had to strip down everything I had on they gave me a cavity search okay hold on let me rephrase that because no man didn't look up in my cavities you had to do the stoop thing where you stoop down and like cough <coughs> if you see if nothing fall out uh, let me just skip past yes all right please <laughs> so dehumanizing dehumanizing us is one of the methods of control where you are now aware that you belongs to them all these things is psychology you know bro you see um so i'm gonna get one big blue crocus bag looking suit outfit and um still not get a phone call when all of that was said and done then bring me up in our another holding cell which i thought was like this other prison again nice i'm like okay but this me can do there's a couple there's like about 10 cells from the upstairs um it was a little annex area like a little intake and i'm like okay if i just so i'm go do till we figure this out i'm go do it about 10 15 one counselor counselor then bring me down to him in my office and i was allowed to make my phone call I made that one phone call, realized that the news was already out because I thought I was breaking the news all the day. No, no, the news is out, everybody's aware. And who is freaking out, freak out. So, could not sleep that night. Could not sleep. But the next morning, I was told that, oh, this is just this era that you are actually yeah the next morning i was told this era is just an era where we keep you overnight before putting you into general population just to make sure say you know gang affiliated so them check you out you must keep you away from gen pop if you check you out i guess my comeback to me is not our blood scripts in our area and nation by the way this era that I was in is a crime riddled era, drug infested but there's a lot of racism up there you know a lot of skinheads Aryan nation may, may, may go sit in the prison anyway, we get to that while I was there then tell me, say, okay, they're going to move me into gen pop, no, next day and I remember walking I didn't get over to Gen Pop until like in the late evening, probably about six in the evening. And give me two dry sandwiches and some sugar and water for drink throughout the day. By about six, they brought me over to Gen Pop. And I remember walking and it was a circular, it's all enclosed. You know, you're not outside the yard. No, no. The yard is like in the middle of the jail. Once one come near where you eat, and all these things there is like a little room where you go do your um work out and thing and thing and you know just just cells around that circles the middle area the common area so people in the common area this is where the tvs are people that play card etc whatever the mother that um i remember when i walked in the entire place looked around at me like who the F is this big man? You know, and of course, me walking, you know, shoulders back, chins up, and they brought me to a cell. And as I went into the cell, me noticed there's two cots, there's two beds in the cell, not no bunker, back, pant up at each other. One cell, one cot over one, one side, and the other cut over on the other side, the, the one bed on one side, one bed on the other side. But we noticed one bed had no cut on it, no mattress. 
And the, you know, as soon as they brought me in, they said, Chuck, we have a, um, we have a guest for you. Chuck, who would turn out to be my roommate, my cellmate, came running in. Chuck, however, was the Dan, <laughs> the Dan for the section at the jail, you know. So when him run in, and him said, my bad, you know, him take off the cut, because I guess I'm alone and I sell him, I have the, my, the extra cuts, and take off the cut and give me and um, put it on my side, and let me give me a couple of basics, you know, including one little half dead bedspread. Well, it was a blanket. It only serves as the bedspread and the cover for you. Because you know, sleep, then I give you extra blanket for you, cover up, whether it's cool or not, you have to figure it out, you know. I look a flimsy toothbrush. I want a little small toothpaste. We're going to last and not more than three days. You have to understand, say, in a jail, you don't ask people for shit. Because if you ask people for well, prison. If you ask someone for shit, for something, you know, belongs to them. So all these little things you have to know, you youngsters who have plan for go to prison. Because some of the things you want to do, you must have planned for go to prison. You know? And I remember Chuck introduced himself like a gentleman, bro, in a seat. And, you know, he never go back out, he just sit there and him talk to him. And I said to him, I said, yo, I guess him pick, pick up on my accent and thing. And we talked for about 30 minutes. And when we talked, I remember Chuck said to me, sir, I can see, sir, you're a bit scared. You know, of course, me never think me the let off that aura, but the man that experienced prison body you know. So I, I think he caught on that. And he said to me, you, you know about the Bible? And I'm going to tell you how this correlates further on down in the video, where the life is a relay. And when someone passes your baton, your job is to run with it over a certain distance and hand off that baton to someone else so they can carry on on their leg of the journey. He said to me, you know about the Bible? I said, yeah man, I'm a God-fearing person. And he says, I'm going to introduce you again if you didn't know about the book of Job read the book of Job and this will calm your fears this man a bad man you know man this man had done as I would go on to find out because at that point I didn't know his status not the jail not the prison but as time went on I realized that a big man this man introduced me to the Bible bro um, I don't want to make this too long, so I'm going to do this in two parts, all right? So I'm just going to talk for five more minutes. I just wanted to give you the intro to my jail experience, my lockup experience. And um, so, you know, I'm sitting on the, on the, on the cut. I'm going back outside and going to do what I'm going to do. Because in the evenings, you have like two and a half hours of like free time before lockdown. Uh, I'm sitting on the cut and I'm thinking to myself, sir. What the hell have I gotten myself into? And at that's this point, you're, you're awash with a mix of emotions. Anger, disappointment, um, just a lot of fear. It's, you, it's, it's fear beyond what you can, I guess, vision and vision like you. Me couldn't explain to you the level of fear that goes through someone's mind in the situation. But however, me get on myself because me realize, uh, I realized where I was. And in the jungle where I was, weaklings and weak animals get snatched up real fucking fast. So I, I get on myself and I went out back into the common era. They were watching TV. This one, my, this was my first prison lesson. Went back up to watch TV. <laughs> I'm telling the bro. And the remote, there's two TVs, two remotes. 
whatever the person who control the TV they watch, that is what we they watch tonight. And secondly, if the cheer, there are cheers that's around and people get out, you watch either whichever TV you want to watch. If the cheer is set a certain way, somebody somebody cheer. In fact, there are certain cheers where even if it's not set a certain way, that are just a man, a certain done in you know, the jail, you know, in the prison cheer. So whether I'm a come out, come watch TV or not, you just don't sit in that cheer. That cheer belongs to a dan. Me don't know this. Me don't see one open cheer in our good spot on the TV when me decides to want to watch. So, I'm going to come through, you know, and everybody will nod them head and nod them head. But I guess Chuck had gone back out and kind of spread the word a little bit. Say, yo, I'm a Jamaican. That, I know that for a fact, that's the, the, the big takeaway from my entry. Some of these guys have never seen a Jamaican in their life. This was a prison that had rapists, people and the way to go up top, um, murderers. There was a lot of racism, racist. What do they call them? Not, I don't want to call them neo Nazis, but white nationalists and white supremacists. It's a whole racist sect, white sect, um, with tattoo in them head and ball, head, the skin, I guess a skin as you call them. I don't know. There's a whole bunch of that in the jail. You know? So I'm um, sitting there. Take my nice little seat, watch my nice little show. And I see everybody kind of look for me, but no man not really say nothing. So the man with the remote, who was apparently a lieutenant, you know, whichever gang him joined, I don't know, said to me, Big bro, that's such and such cheer. So me know like I either say, What? Who? And I was like, Yo, that's such and such. Uh, I'm like, Bro, it's an empty chair. You talk about. So, such and such now, I guess he may not know him in there. Pop up out of nowhere and kind of touch me on my shoulder so and say, No disrespect, big bro, but, you know, this is all. So, me know, I mean, I mean, bro, them knit up same time because, remember, I said, me watch much prison show, you know. So, me know, say, from a man, touch you all, from your hand, and your man, a friend. You go off to defend it, you have to show, say, yo, hey boy, I don't know, little flukes, man, you know. So me, my eyes knit up now, I kind of tense up. And Chuck, who was sitting across watching everything, said to me, say, uh, he said, Dave, Dave, come and introduce myself to him as Dave. He said, Dave, everything is cool, man, don't worry about it, this is how, and I come over and I tell myself, how the system works. And I said, okay, cool, no problem. So the very first day the my inner gen pop, something almost pop. <laughs> you know, but they were real cool. Like the guys them, I don't know if because they hear something at Jamaican. And this is something else I want to speak on again. I'm gonna stop the video here. I want to do a full presentation, but like my survey already at 30 minutes. I'm gonna do a part two to this video when we go drop probably over the weekend. But this is one of the things that I want uh, uh, that I lament. When I started coming to this country, Jamaicans were revered. And I can tell you how many times just my nationality and my accent has gotten me out of diverse dangers without me even having to lift a finger or get too aggressive just to speak and the respect comes. We have lost that luster as yard people. We have lost that ability not to command fear but to command respect and it's because we have now adopted everything we americans do and the mannerism and them social skills all of this kind of bullshit we have gotten away from our culture and our roots bro so now the word jamaican commands no form of respect nowhere anyway we go come back for part two of my Locked Up Abroad presentation. All right? Enough respect. God is my keeper. That's it. This is it, TV. I can talk. Where the icons